we continue our lecture on design of springs and this is the lecture number 28. You recollect uh, that uh, in the last class we discussed about the basic equations of a helical spring and derive certain important relationship. And then we uh, started talking about the design of springs under variable load. Just a very quick revisit to what we have done in the last class was something like this. We found out the basic equation of stress which came out to be of this nature k w 8 f d by pi d cube. Then we came down to find out the deflection of the spring and one thing we uh, did not mention in the last class that is a very important spring parameter it is called the spring rate which is defined as k f by delta and this delta is what we have obtained. So, obviously the expression comes out to be g d to the power 4 8 d cube n where d as you remember is the coil diameter. Now, here when we say coil diameter then please note that this coil diameter normally we will be referring to as mean coil diameter. What it means? means from the if you look to this diagram from this extreme center of the spring wire to the other the uh, center of the spring wire. So, this distance is a mean coil diameter where we will be referring to as d and that also we referred in the last class also as d. So, what is the relationship between the outside diameter? So, obviously very simple relation the mean coil diameter is nothing but d 0 minus d where d 0 stands for outside diameter. Now, this spring rate sometimes also is called as spring constant. So, this was the basic equations what we have learned and then we would like to start with today's lecture whose preamble I have already given in the last class that whenever there is a variable load onto the spring then how do we design in those cases. The first of all what we would like to know is that normally in case of the spring what happens that either it be a compression spring or be a tensile spring or sometimes it is called an extension spring. See the force is always of one kind. What I mean by one kind say it is an compressive then at the most what we can say onto a spring this is a spring suppose uh, suppose it is just in a position of holding the spring between two plates and we give some loading which goes to the maximum when it comes back means when it comes back to this zone then it will be well it will be what sometimes like 0 but not always but what I mean to say that if it is an compressive nature it will never go to an tensile in nature it will be always remaining compressive. Similarly, if you consider an extension spring it will go to a some amount of extension and come back to a lesser amount of extension, but it will never go to a compression zone. So, looking into this fact normally what happens the spring materials are sometimes being tested what we discussed in the last class once again I repeat that it is tested under a torsion of what type? A torsion of repeated stress type means it goes to a maximum value comes down to 0. It go, so, that always we are having if you look into this board then you can see that it is coming to the maximum again going to the 0 and it is that this particular phenomena is going on. So, this is what precisely I would like to say is that this is for the testing of the material. Now, uh, that also describes that one thing that you can 
have any spring loading, suppose a compressive spring loading, if we consider, uh, then you can have something like that. It need not go to 0 always. Okay? That means, in this case, as we have been referring to a positive, so it will be a tensile type of spring, where we go to a maximum tensile. Again, we may release certain amount of tensile, so it means the stress is released, but it will never go to the other side. This will never happen, that is what we would like to say. So, that is the reason what is happening, that we will have a simple, some changes in the variable load design for the springs in contrast to what we have learned in our earlier classes about the variable load design for general machine elements, where we have seen that we faced in, in certain cases a complete reversal of cycle. Uh, it was any general fluctuating stress or a repetitive stress of the kind what has been shown over here. Now, here you can see that all these designations are, all these things are designated as shear type. So, what is this one? This is a tau max and it comes out to be 0. Again, I am repeating that if this is for what? For the material test normally, but the spring can have any sort of loading, but of one kind. That is a very important thing to talk about. So, what we have? The mean stress and the, what we remember? This one we called as stress amplitude. So, this tau a tau m remains to be the same thing as tau max by 2. So, if it is a material testing suppose, then this tau max by 2 well just this tau max by 2 this one what you are getting can be written something as C, if it is an endurance limit, then we go by tau E by 2, something like that, tau E by 2 also can come into picture. <coughs> that means, the maximum one, we are going for a twist and then coming back to 0. So, looking into the fact, what we find out in this particular case is the same Soderbergh failure criteria, but, but what you can look over here that instead of the line starting over here, what we have seen earlier, we are we can find out the there is an the initial line is having a coordinate of tau e by 2 tau e by 2. You remember in the case of Soderbergh failure criteria, when we did in the earlier case, what we took up the material property, the material property was normally evaluated through the fatigue tests undergoing a cyclic reversal. Okay. So, in that case, the cyclic reversal means what will be the value of the mean stress? The mean stress will be 0 and the stress amplitude will have the value of sigma endurance. And here what is happening? As because we are having a repeated stress, as just we have seen earlier, so, we will be having the shift of the point like that, we will be having a mean stress of tau yield point by 2 and again we are having this situation just, we are having the situation that is this is the mean stress for the material property which has shifted by this point. So, this is the mean stress, mean stress. So, these both are tau e by 2, tau e by 2. So, this represents the mean stress and this represents the stress amplitude. So, this is the material property. So, once we go for that one, then what we see? Okay. The rest of the Soderbergh diagram is just shifted over here. So, this as usual, you can see we are having the tau yield point. This is the 
stress amplitude part or the endurance limit, but remember it is all for the shear values. Now, if we choose a typical factor of safety, then obviously the line shifts as it is being shown over here and then what we get? We get this line is a safe stress line. So, any data point or the any failure any point falling onto this line beyond this one is safe and beyond this tight we will be considering to be not safe. So, let us con consider a typical design point over here as shown as A. So, what is the coordinate of A? The coordinate of A is nothing but the tau m. What is this tau m stands for? The mean shear stress that is acting onto the spring and this is the stress amplitude what it is being acting onto the spring. So, under this situation, it is a very simple thing that we can think of a relationship as usual what we have done for earlier case. So, look carefully that we will be selecting this triangle okay, and another one if we select this triangle, then what you see? These two triangles are similar triangles from the basic geometry. So, if this is so, then what we can find out? Then we can find out a relationship that is this is what? This one is tau A means tau stress amplitude divided by this one. So, what we can write down? is something like this, this tau A divided by this side. So, how much is this distance? This distance we can see is tau yield point by A f s minus this zone. So, what is this zone? This is nothing but tau m, so tau m. So, using the similar triangle property, what we do, what we find out from this triangle. Similarly, this value is tau yield point by 2 divided by how much? This distance. Okay. So, what is this distance? This distance is tau yield point minus again this distance. So, this is tau yield point by 2. So, this becomes your simple relationship between the stress amplitude, mean stress, material property like shear yield point and shear endurance limit value and of course, the factor of safety. So, if we arrange this equation in a proper manner, then what we get? We get something like this. That means, this was the original figure. So, if we consider this one, you can see the same expression what we have just written comes out to be like this. So, this is the one we got. So, if you arrange, then we get an equation of this nature. And we can rewrite this equation in various forms and you will be also finding in several other literatures, this same expression may be written in a different way, but the basic understanding remains the same. Now, you understand that the same equation has been modified by one factor k s. 
What is this factor? Do you remember? This factor is shear correction factor, what we learnt last time and this is the wall correction factor, which takes into account of what curvature and the shear together. Now, you can see that it is customary that the mean stress or the stress tau m is being multiplied by the factor k s, whereas this stress amplitude tau a is being multiplied by the wall correction factor k w. So, what we get? We get a relationship something like this that 1 by f s equal to k s into tau m by tau y, k w tau a tau y into 2 tau y by tau e minus 1. So, we consider the expression what has been shown here as the form of the equation, what we get for the Soderberg failure criteria for variable loading. So, now you understand that this particular expression we will be utilizing for designing of the springs when it is undergoing a variable load or a fluctuating load whichever you may call it. Let us look into one aspect next is that Well, this is what you can see is the estimation of material strength. Now, this is a very important aspect. What is being done in design of the this particular spring is that whether you go for a design under static condition or a design under variable load situation, you have to have the knowledge of the shear yield point property or in case of this particular variable load design, you have to know also the endurance limit for shear. Now, what it has been seen that uh, most of the materials are being tested for tensile strengths. That is a very simple type of experiment and we get a quick data and regarding this we have already discussed earlier. So, what is the thing what I would like to point out is that mostly we have the data for the material for the tensile strength. So, from those data we can find out what are the situations or the strengths coming due to the tensile test that is mainly the yield point in tension and the ultimate point in tension tests. However, as you can see that we require the shear values of the corresponding strengths in tensile one has to undergo an or undertake an experiment to find out the actual data or find out from various experimental data collected together to get an knowledge of what should be the values from the ultimate strength values to the yield point value, I mean shear point values. So, First and foremost thing is that one has to find out the value of what we consider is this particular one, what is the value of sigma ultimate. Now, the best way of finding out the sigma ultimate is this thing that you find out from the database 
What is database? Means standard design handbooks and other sources where use experimental data for the simple tensile tests are available from which you get the values of sigma ultimate. And then you try to find out the values of the shear corresponding shear values. Now, in case of the spring design, it has been observed that this sigma ultimate values are quite sometimes dependent on the wear diameter of the spring. Hence, from the experimental results, sometimes a formula of the type what has been depicted over here is being used. What is this particular formula? You can see that sigma ultimate equals to a constant a divided by wire diameter to the power another exponent. Now, for some selected materials which are commonly used for the spring design, the values of a s and m s are given over here. So, we can see that these values 1510, etc., and this is the diameter to the power this particular value will give you a stress in ampere. Okay? These values will give you a stress in ampere. That means, this particular one should be in ampere uh, and then you you get the corresponding values of the ms uh, well that means uh, let me write it little clearly that means what you get that this using these constants what we have given over here and corresponding exponents this sigma ultimate will have a unit of ampere. Now, in this case, what one can do is that utilize this expression to find out the value of sigma ultimate or else as we have told that you get from some data base source and take the value of the sigma ultimate. Now, here comes another relationship that for all those materials for which for all those materials for which you have found out these values of sigma ultimate this for all these values what we have got for the sigma ultimate, it can be equivalently utilizing these factors, we can obtain either the endurance limit value or we can get the yield point value. Please note that for all these cases the shear stress carried out from 0 to maximum load means that repeated stress experiments have been carried out and from which the values of yield point has been derived and thus from the experimental fact such table can be prepared. And one such example has been given over here which shows you can see onto this board that this shows that if we consider such relationship, then what you get? You get that tau yield point by tau ultimate is 0.21 for hard drawn, for oil tempered wear it is 0.22, chrome vanadium 0.20, chrome silicon 0.20, music wear 0.23 and the 303 stainless steel wire it is 0 0.20 and the correspondingly if you want to find out that yield point value then what you get these are the uh, constants 0 0.42, 0 0.45, 0 0.51 etcetera, etcetera. Now, we can see this list is not an exhaustive one 
For other materials, what you have to find out? You have to find out in the similar manner the values of the yield point and the endurance limit values, okay, whenever you are going for the design for the variable load. Now, uh, this comes out to be a very important fact in the design that the choice of the material strength or how do you determine the material strength. As you know the best will always uh, would be to have a real test carried out and in case it is not possible then one has to resort to this type of data base and get the corresponding values. Now the extensive database is beyond the scope of this lecture one can uh, j just go through the reference handbooks on this particular matter and get those values. Well, uh, as a very rough estimation or a, you know uh, just an first hand uh, consideration, here we have tried to give you a safe considerations. Just looking at this particular data or the this constant, one can very well say that the tau endurance means tau E by sigma ultimate is simply 0.2 and tau yield point by sigma ultimate is simply 0.4. Maybe this is safe means this is a very conservative design, but anyway one can just roughly one can use these values to have and design approximations. So, we have gone through this one, we have gone through this one. Well, next comes the types of compression springs those are normally used. We know that two types of compression, uh, two types of springs are normally is in use. One is a compression spring, one is an extension spring. So, when we talk about the compression spring, normally we will be having two kinds, uh, four kinds of compression springs. One is the plain, line, plain end and other one if you can see is the plain and ground end then square and closed ends and then squared and ground ends. Each has got its own, ma uh, own merits and demerits, but let us go for that what we mean by all this nomenclatures what has been shown in this board. Now, total coils will be the number of coils what you can find over here. Now, then why especially the total coil word has been used? Sometimes what happens that some that we will be seeing just after some time that just for a better sitting sometimes you grind off this portion, grind off this portion and you get a total coil of this nature. So, once you get this one, then you can see over the length, although there are some other coils present over here, but those are not counted. So, in other words, what we mean to say is that only those coils which are really taking up the spring actions are called the N and this is termed as active coils. So, active coils are those coils which are taking part in the particular spring stress or spring nomenclature when we are defining means these are the mainly responsible for springing actions and other coils may be present, but due to certain amount of manufacturing just like that grounding and etcetera. These will not contribute to the total springing actions. So, we understand that there will be one term called active coils and wherever you find this particular one is written as N, then you understand this is always the active coil. 
So, we understand that this one total coil. So, in case of plane end as because there is no other manufacturing considerations, the total coils is simply the same as number of actual coils. What is solid length? Solid length is that length means if you just take up the spring and put a load over here and press it in such a way that all these gaps are disappearing means entire this coil, this coil, this coil clashing with each other and makes a solid body. So, that is what we call as a solid length. So, in this case the relationship between the solid length and the total number of turn is given over here for this typical plane end that solid length is equals to d is a spring wire diameter into n t plus 1. So, that is it is understandable. So, these are the number of coils each is having d. So, d into n t and plus 1 as I told you to take care of the other coils which may or may not be actively taking part. Although we can see it is taking actively part of all the end coils, but still for the this parts all together add up to another value 1. So, it, we get the solid length as, as it is given over here. What is free length? The figure over here what is being depicted is purely the free length. This is the free length means you just keep the spring as it is then the length it will show up is the free length. So, what is free length? This is the solid length and this is a solid length plus delta max. What is delta max? Means the maximum amount of compression it can have is the delta max and that means that delta max plus solid length will give you the free length. But anyway, always people consider certain amount of more length called allowance. What is this allowance meant for? So, that in design we will be considering this delta max. If this delta max is to the fullest extent, then what will happen? This coil and this face of the coil will clash with each other. So, that means there could be some amount of wear taking place due to this clash of the wires. To avoid that, what you understand? That means you keep certain amount of clearance. So, uh, this particular D allowance is meant for that and this is normally 15 percent of delta max. But anyway, there is no such definite situation that can guide us that what should be the allowance, but I am giving you a uh, just a guideline that 15 percent of the allowance, uh, 15 percent of the delta max is the allowance. So, this is what we get and then you come down once again to the pitch. So, what is this pitch? This is L minus D by N. So, you understand the pitch just like an screw, this is the pitch what you get for the coil. So, that is L minus D that is free length minus D by N that gives you the total nomenclature of a compression spring having the plane ends. I need not repeat for all other springs, but you can see the next one will be for plane and ground ends, where you can see total number of coil is n plus 1, solid length here it becomes d into n t, free length as usual, but pitch is L divided by n plus 1. Next you go to the squared or closed ends. See earlier what is a squared and closed end and the plane end the difference lies over here. Earlier the spring head was going like that. Now, here if you ground it then plane and ground, but in this case what you can find out that the last coil is not going in the proper manner. It is being pressed to make a make a some sort of flat end and this is what we called a squared end or closed end. Now, if 
you look at the next one, then you will be finding out the square and ground end. So, there you will be having something like this. This means something like this, you have squared it again, made it and ground it, so that it can properly sit in the sitting coil. So, what you get? This is a squared and closed end and next one we get squared and grounded. Already I told you about that, that one in the earlier slide. So, this is the picture of what you find out by the square and ground end compression springs. So, this are the four types of compression springs normally is used in design and you have learned that what are the nomenclatures of a spring that is the total coil, solid length, free length, pitch, etcetera. We have talked about this springs of the compression type. Now, next we will go to learn more about the other type of spring that is the extension springs. So, you can see a uh, part of an extension spring with a hook which is this is the what we call this is the hook ok and this view is shown over here and this is the spring body in the extension spring. Now, you can see the simple relationship is a body length L b is given by d into n plus 1, where n again stands for the active coil and free length is the L b the body length plus the 2 the hook diameter. So, only two nomenclatures to define the extension springs. Now, one of the situation that come into picture is that this hook. Now, this primarily this hook are hooks are unavoidable because as you know that the spring has to be held at some location. So, to hold the spring at some location what you require that you require some sort of a hook or a bend onto the spring heads to facilitate holding of the load. Now, a typical hook has been depicted over here, but by putting such hook what happens? Certain amount of stress concentration comes at this bend zone and these are substantially weaker zone compared to what of you can see for the other spring bodies. So, one has to take care to see that while designing the hook, one should take the steps so that the stress concentration is reduced. Now, here you can see the same extension spring with little modification or improvement which has been incorporated so that the stress concentration is reduced at the hip zone. Now, you see that in this case what is happening? A total loop just like this loops what is happening, a total loop is just turned up that means by some means it is purely turned up to this zone and this makes a what has been written as a gradual sweeping curve. So, anything going in a very gradual manner as we know that stress concentrations will be highly released. So, this is one way and another way please look at the board that you can see that this is a mean coil diameter ok and this d by 2 means is radius. So, from this radius if you can see that gradually if I just join these lines 
and you can see that gradually there is a reduction of the radius. So, this was d by 2, then gradually it is reduced and then you make a hook like that. So, that means a gradual reduction of n terms from d by 2 to a some form like this, also a way by which you can relieve the stresses in the tension springs. So, now we have learned two types of helical springs, one is the compression spring, another is the extension or tension spring. And we have also learned about what their constructional features and the nomenclatures. Now, here another important situation comes into picture is that buckling of compression springs. By now, uh, after going through the basic courses, you have learned about buckling. What is this buckling? It is some sort of an instability that is normally showed up when a long slender bars or column something like that are applied with compressive type of load. So, the similar situation comes whenever you consider a spring body. If the spring becomes too slender and quite long, then what happens? That it sways away sidewise and what we call normally as a buckling failure. Means, uh, if we look to a spring of this type and it is a compressive, of course, the buckling will take place for a compressive type of spring. Then what happens? If it is an instability, it is the buckling is occurring in an instable situation, then what happens? Something like this means a spring takes up a shape like this. So, this is what is normally called buckling of the spring. So, what is the idea? The one of the idea what we try to learn in this particular buckling of the compression springs that when you are designing, if you find that free length is uh, uh, I think uh, uh, this uh, this uh, should be uh, not less than please no this is if the free length is roughly four times the coil diameter to avoid that means free uh, free length uh, uh, excuse me excuse me it was okay that means free length should be four times the coil diameter less than 4 times the coil diameter to avoid buckling for most situations. Please note that I am just uh, using the word most situation because just I will explain it after some time. Now, in this case what is happening? For slender springs central guide rod is necessary. Means, if we find that the after calculations the spring is likely to buckle then one has to use a guide rod passing through the center of the spring axis. So, so about which the spring should compress and I mean the compression action of the spring should takes place along this particular guide rod. Now, as a guideline uh, you can see the L the free length that should be this one it should be less than pi d c e, you understand this is the e and g has a standard meaning of the elast modulus of elasticity and, mo and shear modulus of elasticity. And in case of steel, if we use a value of e to be what? 200 gpa and uh, g to be uh, 80 gpa, then uh, you get a relationship for the steel material that L is 2 point should be less than 2.57 d by C e, where C e are the 
this C E are the end conditions what has been given over here. Now, fixed at both ends means what? That means you are something what is a you are push I mean you are placing some sort of plates through which it is being the spring is being compressed. So, you get a 0.5 hinge at one end and this is a plate at one end this is the 0 0.707 and hinged at both ends and fixed at one end and free at other end. So, that is the reason if you look for all the engineering applications that mostly you will be finding out um, <coughs> these situations that is the reason I have used a word the free length should be less than 4 times the coil diameter to avoid buckling for most situations and it is not always, but roughly as a thumb rule you can see it, but it requires a checking for each and every individual spring whether the buckling is taking place or not. So, you always keep in mind that any spring you design you compute its free length and have a check for this relationship taking up the values of the end conditions what has been given over, over here. So, this is a very important aspect because if there is an buckling then obviously, the design either has to be changed and if it is impossible to change the design due to certain other constraints then what you have to use you know you have to use a central guide and once you use a central guide obviously, the machine component design has to take a another shape. So, a check for buckling is also very important. Now, let us see another aspect of the design of the springs that is what we called as spring surge or the determination of the critical frequency of a spring. Now, what is that? Normally, it this particular phenomena can be uh, explained in the way that if we say give a load onto this spring some F load is given onto the spring. Then what happens whenever a load is applied then a some short of just due to this particular movement of the spring say a wave travels across the spring and then it again goes back and this type of phenomena continues. Something like that if you see uh, in a closed body or a, uh, in a closed water body, if you put some sort of disturbances, the way the disturbances goes towards the end or the towards the walls and then again return. So, similar situation happens whenever a forcing function acts onto a this particular spring. Now, this particular situation is called the surging of the spring in the sense that if this particular travel of the wave becomes equal to the natural frequency of the spring, then immediately there will be an resonant frequency and you know this will be detrimental and there will be a failure of the spring or likelihood of a failure of the spring, then what the, what the design is predicting. Okay? That means, before the design predictions the failure of the spring may occur. This is actually called a spring surge. So, what is the idea? That means, once you have designed a spring, then what you have to take into care that you find out the critical frequency of the spring. And if this critical frequency is different than what is your actual operational frequency, then the chances of resonance is less. Now, you know uh, 
there will be there there is a natural frequency which we call as a fundamental frequency and it will have other frequencies what we called as that first natural frequency then you can have the second natural frequency like that. So, other modes ca also can be calculated, but normally what happens that it is of the interest that you only take up the fundamental frequency calculate for the fundamental frequency and use a judgment to predict the operational frequency of the spring. Now, in this case we will see that this fundamental frequency what it is being given over here which is of our interest all right now this particular fundamental frequency can be okay can be obtained by the relationships what you can see is that f equals to half root over k into g by w s and another one is f equal to one fourth root over k into g by w s. So, first expression explains for both ends within flat plates and the second expression that is this particular expression describes the formula for fundamental frequency when one end is free and other end on a flat plate. In this case what you can see is that this k we call the spring rate. So, that we have already learnt earlier w s is a spring weight and this particular expression of the spring weight is given by this particular formula 2.47 gamma d square capital D into n. So, here you know d is a wire diameter, this capital D is a coil diameter, n is a number of active turns and gamma is a specific weight of the spring material. So, that will give you the weight of the spring. So, you substitute the value of the weight of the spring over here, you must be knowing the k value that is the spring constant or the spring index and the g you can find g is the known acceleration due to gravity. Now, how this 2.47 gamma d square d n is coming? It is very simple idea of what we get is like that. You just compute the volume of the spring. How you get the volume of the spring? cross sectional area ok. So, pi d square by 4 into total length of the spring, what is the total length of the spring? This should be pi d 1 length multiplied by a capital N. So, that will be capital N is a number of active coils. So, this becomes the volume of the spring and once you know the volume of the spring, you multiply by the gamma that is a specific weight. So, what is this idea? So, that means, this specific weight you, you know that this specific weight we consider as rho into g, rho is the density of the material and g is acceleration due to gravity. So, that means, this expression you get like this. So, once you get it, so this is the this comes out to be pi square by 4 multiplied by d square capital D in gamma. Now, you please note down that uh, uh, one has to be very careful about the units what, what you prescribe because this is the situation it is coming like this that you have got root over k g by w this one is k newton per meter g 
meter per second square. Now, uh, well, a uh, half or one fourth may be there, say half divided by this is w. So, that means what you do, you find out the volume, volume is meter cube, density is kg per meter cube, and again you use a g meter per second square. So, that this meter cube cancels, this meter cube cancels, kg meter per second square is equivalently Newton, this Newton, this Newton cancels. So, under root becomes 1 upon s. So, this is the unit what you get. So, here uh, normally rho, simple rho will not work, rho multiplied by g. This is a mistake, you, all of you know, but still I am just giving you a, a this particular caution that sometimes we miss this one, so that a unit correspondence uh, may not be correct. So, this this expresses that what we get is that this k, uh, this particular one ultimately that pi square by 4 is nothing but this 2.47 uh, and this is the specific weight. So, this is not mass, but this is the weight. So, once you find out the fundamental frequency, then normally what you do is that you take the operational value of the spring at least 15 to 20 times less than the natural frequency. So, this will ensure, ensure you that the spring surge will not occur and uh, if you take about this value, margin of around this value, then not only the fundamental frequency, but other modes of frequencies will also can be taken care of. So, this is the more or less the ideas what we concentrate for the design of the springs. And next thing what we will be doing is that we will be taking up a simple example to illustrate the how we design a typical spring. So, that we can take up in the next lecture. Thank you.